Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. I am your host and producer. My name is James Pagoshnik. Thank you guys so much for listening. And on the other end of the table, we have our analyst and co-host. You know him as Arifa San, Mr. Useful Human. How you doing? Welcome to New York. Hey, I'm great. <laughs> it's like the third time we've tried to do this, so yeah. we're gonna like we're just gonna we're just gonna roll with this and see how long it's gonna uh, how long it's gonna go. So, uh, again, welcome to the show. We are live from Bar None here in the uh, here in the. Uh, <laughs> I say in Minneapolis. I'm about to say Minneapolis again. No, we are here in New York, uh, next to Gramercy Park. This is an awesome, awesome little area. New York has been very cool to uh, to me anyway so far. Oh, it's been phenomenal to me. Yeah, this yeah. is this has been great. Uh, Want to thank a couple of people, Brian especially for uh, for helping getting everything uh, uh, going here once we actually uh, once we actually like arrived and got things uh, kind of settled here. Uh, as my computer decides it doesn't want to be working much oh, no. anymore. We will survive anyway. Uh, and, and Jesse, of course, again, thank you so much for, uh, uh, for giving us the idea and helping, uh, and helping us go. This has, been, uh, this has been a lot of fun so far. Um, although I will say that the number of Diggs jerseys in the room is more it than, than I, I would have expected. Yeah. I, I say more than, but, but here's my problem. It, oh, and then we got the Bridgewater. Yeah. Right. A Bridgewater and, jersey. And we got, and yeah. we got the Bridgewater, <laughs> Bridgewater shirt. <laughs> No, everyone's kind of holding yeah. out on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, weird, exactly. weird. So, but the big thing that uh, that I was going to mention is, so I may have acquired a Vikings jersey through less than legal means necessarily. You've acquired a Vikings jersey. I acquired a Vikings jersey, Full yes. stop. Okay. And, uh, excellent, thank you so much. And uh, while I did so, uh, it was, it was, it was I presumably made in China, sold from China, uh, so I got it, and I got it in a very large size because I'm a li- very large human being. Now, a regular American uh, size jersey will fit on me. However, the uh, the two X for the uh, Chinese version of it right. did not fit at all. Now, I had a problem with this because I was trying to figure out necessary. I was trying to figure out the t- one of two things happened. Either a this was not an adults like two X thing. Right. Fine. It's pretty or reasonable. this was like Chinese adult like 2X and it wasn't like made for American. But I still like felt like the fat guy in the little coat. <laughs> yeah. I'm like I'm trying to get fat. <laughs> these things don't really stretch much. And if they do, no. it's not in a very it's not in a very flattering way. So you get your so jersey even, on, you shimmy so it's it. It's not even like the jersey material that Weird. No, it was just like it was. Huh. It was misery for a moment. I didn't end up bringing the Diggs jersey as a result. Like I, I went out. I spent my hard twenty nine dollars <laughs> to oh, get this <laughs> to yeah. get this jersey that looked. It, it's such a nice knockoff. Whatever five year old made this. <laughs> exactly. I, whoever, whatever five year old made it really needs to talk to its mother about those five goals. But. Not the point. Anyway, again, welcome to the show. We got a couple things we're going to talk about. Obviously, we're going to be talking about New York, uh, talking about the New York Post article as well, which is one of the saltier of things yeah. than uh, that has been written about, Beautiful, about the Vikings and you know Kirk Cousins. Uh, a little bit of a Viking, or a little bit of a uh, Vikings Jets uh, preview and the mailbag as well. We got plenty of good questions, and then we're going to be taking some from the audience as well. So let's uh, let's get into it. The first thing I do want to mention is about. Uh, uh, as, a, as a quick thank you to everyone who has donated to the, to the show previously, who has shared the link online, uh, who's ever helped us out. Again, we really do appreciate it. Uh, we did get a donation in from Sarah and Steve, who said, Arif and James, we're bummed we can't join you in New York. London was great. Enjoy a round on us. And indeed we will. A little quick cheers, guys. Cheers. Go. 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 Thank you guys Go. so much. Go. Cheers to you guys. Again, if you would like to donate to the show, you can do so in one of two different ways. You can go to patreon.com slash Norse Code. That's more of a monthly subscription. You can do $1 a month, Tree Fitty, help people lock that monster at bay. Or you can give just a PayPal donation at paypal.me slash Norse Code. So, uh, let's get that out of the way. Uh, what are your initial impressions on, uh, on the trip to New York? Uh, people seem to ask food questions of us often. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, What was For your some first reason. official yeah. food uh, experience here, here in New York? Well, I mean, official, I guess I'd have to, I mean, because I went to like uh, a place called Black Forest, which does like Bavarian food. It was really good. Um, but, you know, I had to get like a New York style slice. I had to get, uh, you know, a bagel. Uh, or however you pronounce it here. Um, 
Um, De depending on which, depending on which borough and which neighborhood in right. said borough. So I went to I went to Queens. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the uh, Danny's Pizzeria uh, for the slice. It was supposed to be. I was told this was like the standard. They've made it this way for like 40 years. Uh, you're not going to see a lot of tourists there, which for some reason is a good thing. Um, but I mean, sure, right? Uh, and it was delicious. I think that like the idea that like so there's this idea I've seen from like food bloggers that like if you go to a place that's like known for food and you have the food there it's gonna be mediocre Chicago deep dish style pizza in Chicago is not as good as it is elsewhere because they've like rested on their laurels or whatever uh, but this is like this was delicious it's one of the best places of pizza I've ever had it was incredible the the I mean like you could tell like there's no sugar in the tomato sauce the tomatoes were like naturally sweet they really care about the way that the, the crust was made the cheese was beautiful it was fantastic. And then I had a bagel. Uh, you, you have to eat bagel. You have to get your bagels fresh. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I had it with the whitefish salad. Um, delicious. Uh, it was fan no, I mean, it's not. It's like nothing's like lutefisk. Um, it was delicious. So uh, everything I've been told about like the things that you have to eat in New York, I wholeheartedly endorse. So the first thing I did when I uh, when I landed uh, was promptly fell asleep. I mean, that makes sense. I, I took two red eyes out here to be cheap, and uh, I paid for it. So I, 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 I fell asleep and then woke up, and I still couldn't hear out of my right ear. And I literally five minutes ago just yeah, got you just that ability that back. It's like the second coming of Christ there. Just, oh my God, I could hear again. Um, but uh, so the first thing I did once I regained consciousness uh, was I ended up uh, taking a cab down to... Uh, well, first thing I did was I, I remembered a video from Anthony Bourdain who said the two things you need to remember when you, when you go to New York was that A, uh, have a terrible uh, dirty water hot dog. Yes. Did that. That does not take long as it turns out in my neighborhood. <laughs> uh, right next to Central Park, so it's like right. vendors. Uh, and then the second thing is that, we, that New York has better deli than you. So yeah. you need to go to get deli, and I went to Cass's. And I am, I am saddened by the fact I will never have a better hot pastrami sandwich in my life than what I had at like five this afternoon. How was the line? It was not bad at four or five, or four yeah, five o'clock. Yeah. It, it was perfect timing for that. And uh, the pickles were everything I wanted to be and more. It was, it was fantastic. But you know, the great thing about where I'm located is there is literally a 24, there's a 24 hour Taco Bell open, like a block <laughs> from where I'm staying. So like, I'm, I'm set. Like if I wake up at 4 a.m. and really need, you know, border fries or whatever the hell they're called, like, <laughs> I can, why, t why a 24 hour, t I can't, I, mean, but I like, get 24 hour everything else. But, but, like, like, but like, where do you need to go once you have the munchies? You need to yeah, but like, I, I, I just, listen, I've been hammered before. No. At a certain, I don't you? believe it. This, is, this has never happened. I don't, this has never happened before. Uh, but I've, there's a certain hour at which the, the, the bell curve for the bell turns. Right around the 3.30 to 4.30 to 5.30, like, they do breakfast, but why? <laughs> so, like, no, you, you don't If you need... trust their ground beef, I assume you've automatically started trusting their eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if truer words have ever been said on this show. <laughs> so, uh, the other thing I did want to quick mention is, uh, uh, besides the fact that you live in traffic here, uh, that... The smell of pot smoke throughout all of the East Village was so impressive today. It was very impressive. I have impressive. been to fish concerts that smelled less, <laughs> less like the stinky weed in, in, in the East Village. I enjoyed that. That was Dude. that was hilarious. I walked through that park and was just like, somebody needs to change their like sock laundry or something. It was amazing. Well, so, overall, I've been like warned about like. You know, New York smells, they don't have alleys, and you know, they put trash in the street. And the thing is, like, I, like, people shouldn't warn me about that because I have been to like the smelliest cities on earth, right? Uh, not to call out like where my parents are from, but Bangladesh is incredibly smelly, right? This was like pleasant compared to that. So I just have a really high tolerance for like what the worst could be. This wasn't even that bad. Yeah, and Arif and I were talking about this uh, uh, when I had landed. It was like, 
Yeah, it was like, Brooklyn smells great. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. You don't understand, like, it's sugar beet season where I'm from. <laughs> and when that, when the wind wafts that over, it's, yeah, because oh. we compared it, it was like, Grand Forks was the worst out of the three. Yeah, Grand Forks then, is And then Bangladesh. Awful. Yeah. And then, then it's, you know, it, Brooklyn was fine. Yeah. Like, you know, it's going to smell terrible. It was fine. Uh, so let's talk about the New York Post article for just a moment because it resurfaced this <laughs> week. <laughs> yeah, it resurfaced this week uh, when. Well, it's, sort of, it's, te it's technically a new article by a different author. It, it, but it's the same speaking. article. It's, it's literally the same thing. Yeah. It's just the. Uh, it's retelling of Kirk Cousins' story where he was talking about earlier in the offseason about how he was talking to the Jets, but he wasn't really interested in the Jets. He really wanted the Vikings. But. Much like some guy who's got two girls that he's like, he's, he's going for the one for prom. I'm really maybe interested that in how you're going to end this. <laughs> <laughs> he's got the one potential prom date that he's not sure, but he's got the, he's got the backup. You know, and the ugly, the, the ugly girl he's wearing. He's going to win you the Super Bowl. <laughs> exactly. You <laughs> know he went with the one he knows he's going to score with. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah, he, exactly. <laughs> he, he went... <laughs> wow, even I wasn't, I wasn't going to try to go there, but <laughs> apparently that's what we're doing. So, uh, but he ended up going with the Vikings, and the, 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 the article was talking about how... Wait, well, they call, the headline calls him classless. I pulled it up for the show. I mean, I have to, right? What? Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> New York has a different level of classless, like... Stick it to classless. <laughs> yeah. Really? Classless Kurt. No, no, no. Ooh. <laughs> How, whatever. I mean, but it's like it's it's a pretty great read. I mean, if you don't take it seriously, I, right, yeah. There's some like pretty good lines. Like um, my favorite had to be. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Read it. Yeah. The the Mall of America over Manhattan. I thought that was pretty elegantly crafted. Uh, the uh, Olive Garden over Il Milano. Like wow, wow. Yo, that's crap because tomorrow I'm going to go to Times Square and take a selfie in front of the Olive Garden in Times Square. I'm not allowed to go in, apparently. But I am taking a selfie in front of it, damn it. But yeah, they were like complaining that he like leveraged an offer to get more money, like, which is, which is like how, yeah, how, tough how dare you? Yeah. How dare you? Like you get a job offer from somewhere else and you want to stay at the same company, you leverage that to get a raise. I mean, right. It's like pretty normal stuff. A darn shit. Yeah. Darn, darn sham. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the article continues to go uh, to discuss how he never really intended to sign with the Jets and was basically using them. And I mean, as okay. far as yeah, I yeah. can yeah. tell, and every yeah. NFL team uses the Jets. It's yeah, fine. I just, I just feel like I feel like the Jets should be happy that they've been this useful for the first time in like 40 years. <laughs> If, if it's the first time you're really useful since the butt fumble, I feel like I feel like this is appropriate. But if that's not how you feel, then that's not how you feel. But if anything, this is just more proof that Kirk Cousins, who uh, I think issued some form of apology or something, yeah, in a I... half-hearted "I'm driving my van and don't have time to talk" sort of way, his windstar, yeah. <laughs> but like, I don't know. I'm not like I. It does It seems like one of those huge non-stories, but it just goes to prove that this is not a market that Kirk Cousins would have thrived in. Right, because he responded to like some random tabloid. Like, yeah. don't don't take them seriously. They yeah. win by you responding. Like, yeah. whatever. The best line in the article has to be like this. Like, they've just inserted the weather forecast at the end. It was like a pre-written line, obviously. <laughs> Revenge is a dish best served cold. The high on Sunday is expected to be about 52 degrees. End paragraph. Like, Ooh, what? 52? Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't, wasn't, it, degrees. From Minnesota. Right? wasn't that colder at Green Bay the other day? Yeah. yeah. Like, Kirk Cousins is from Michigan. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what, what do you expect? He's not North Dakota tough, but he's Michigan. Yeah, yeah he's not quite North that's, Dakota tough. That's yeah. a different level of tough. <laughs> Avengers best served tepid. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> this is this is gonna be quite the tepid day. So let's let's move on to a bit of the Jets game preview because we there there's a little bit uh, for the Jets that's that's unknown. Sam Darnold is a rookie this year. He they decided to go with him over Teddy Bridgewater, uh, shipping Teddy Bridgewater off to the dirty, dirty Saints. 
Ooh. There we go. That was the, in case you're so, curious, that was the appropriate response. Right. <laughs> so, a little awkward, this is also apparently a Saints bar. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, was, I was not told this beforehand, Jesse. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> I found it out on Facebook and just assumed you kicked them out. We throw them back to the swamp, it's fine. Yeah. So, uh, but Sam Darnold is, uh, is, is a rookie, has a lot of stuff out there that people haven't seen necessarily. But this seems to be a game that really lives, or a team that really lives and dies by the run game. Uh, I guess the first question I have is about Darnold. Do, out of the games that he has played, does he have any real tells or like abilities that the Vikings can kind of force him to? Does to, he to, have abilities? Does he have ability? <laughs> um. we, we talked about the end of Marvel movies before. Right? <laughs> This, this, like all of a sudden, like his, 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 he gets his spidey sense yeah, and right, yeah. throws a pick. Like, <laughs> what does he do? Well, okay, so he's second in the league in interception rate. Uh, first, if you don't count C.J. Beathard, which don't. Um, <laughs> but, but and I think it's because he likes to take a lot of chances. And there's gonna be a problem with Quincy Anunua out. Uh, you know, they've got to rely on Jermaine Curse. They've got to rely on like Jordan Leggett. They've got to rely on the rookie tight end Chris Herndon. Um, I think he's going to probably dump it off a lot to Isaiah Crowell and Bilal Powell, who have been having, you know, a pretty good year. I mean, like every other game. Um, and so, I mean, we'll see. I mean, he's supposed to be this, like, remarkably good decision maker for someone of his age. And I think that's probably true. That but sounds just, like something that, like, I, that sounds like something that you say to somebody who just got, like, a scholarship. <laughs> like he, he's getting a thousand dollars from the American Legion because he's a good decision maker for his age. <laughs> he walks that girl home. Right, yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, and he throws a lot of picks. He fumbles the ball. I mean, he's he's like he's supposed to get like generate a lot of turnovers, um, but he does like do stuff that can be pretty impressive in terms of like where he, and how he sees the field. Um, I do think that kind of like Josh Rosen, who I liked a lot more coming out. Uh, you can confuse him with a bunch of different looks. If you take a look at the picks that he's thrown, um, you know, it's kind of the opposite of how the Jets themselves have gotten picks, where a lot of them are actually just kind of the result of Darnold not seeing kind of the defense that he expected to see. So he's really good at uh, a lot of, like, post-snap diagnosis, but if there's a lot of trickery in the defense, you know, it can confuse a cover one for a cover two and stuff like that. Um, you can run a trap coverage and, and grab a pick. So I think... I mean, I think they're going to do a lot of the same things that they did against Josh Rosen in order to kind of create that confusion. Uh, I mean, Darnold's a little bit more, I guess, quote-unquote, pro-ready. Um, he's a little bit more familiar with how to set protections. That was one of the problems that Rosen had. His offensive coordinator seems to know what the hell he's doing. <laughs> the last Somewhat. couple of games. The last couple of games. The first couple of games, Otherwise, he was not being yeah. very creative. Yeah. But, yeah, in the last couple of games, the offensive coordinator's a lot more competent than whatever's happening in Arizona. Um, so Whatever it's gonna be is it's get yeah, right. It's gonna be tougher to generate those turnovers. It's gonna be tougher to to stop them. But at the same time, it's not. There, there's not much uh, there in terms of like the the threats that you have to shut down. Mm -hmm. uh, it's weird because if you take a look at sort of all the tendencies, you know, some teams will excel somewhere, right? Like uh, the Rams and the Eagles do a ton of play action. Uh, you know, uh, the Rams will do a lot of deep passing. But if you take a look at the way Darnold is like kind of designed his game, it's all a bunch of very average stuff. They do a bunch of, they're average in terms of the amount of play action stuff that they do. They're average in terms of how often they want to pass deep. Uh, the offensive coordinator does like screen passes a lot, but it's not, it's not overwhelming. It's not like... Uh, Keenum last year for right, the Vikings, right, where it yeah, turned yeah. out that was his bread and butter. Um, so there's not a ton of like distinctive stuff that you can kind of jump on in terms of the way they've designed their offense. And in some ways that makes it kind of boring, but it's working a little bit for the Jets. I mean, they're three and three, right? Um, it's working a little bit for what they do, but uh, what is interesting is uh, when they do engage in play action passing, they're actually one of the few teams that generates fewer yards per attempt that has a lower completion rate on play action passes, which is really weird. There's like four teams that are like that. And three of them, I think it's kind of fluky because they're just bad teams. Um, but for the Jets, I'm not even sure like why that's the case. I think there's a timing issue with the way they do play action passing and the way that the receivers break in the routes. So that's probably an area where the Vikings have the ability to kind of exploit them and, uh, and make sure that they like read their keys on play action passes. So what about the uh, what about the receivers that the Jets have? Do you, 
they've they've had more turnover there than like a telemarketing call center. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. They've, they've lost. Uh, they've lost their like contested catch guys. They've lost Brandon Marshall, Eric Decker. They don't have Quincy Anunua, who is really good. But yeah, uh, the the receiver situation. They're very volatile receivers. You got a bunch of big play guys like Quincy Anunua, Robbie Anderson. Uh, Terrell Pryor, when he does make the plays. The ghost of Terrell Pryor. Is right, yeah. Who, I mean, really good. Yeah, I mean, he's good when he's not, like, being a dick to cops. Well, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's a bunch of really volatile receivers, and they're going to have to rely on Jermaine Curse to provide some level of consistency, which, I mean, he's done for Seattle, but he's not like... Um, I mean, he's not like Jarius Wright, right? Like, where, where you do have, like, an engaged sense of right. consistency, third down production. He's just the most consistent of that receiving core. Right. Um, so, I mean, and, and the Jets are underdogs, so they should probably try to get as many big big plays as possible, pass, as, pass deep as often as possible. Um, over the past couple of weeks, Darnold has been better on those deep passes. So I would imagine that they're going to try and create a pretty volatile game and, uh, and not try to win, the, win against the Vikings by out-executing them because I don't think they have the talent healthy enough right now to do it. Well, the Vikings are incredibly vulnerable when a decent tight end shows up. Do the, do the Jets have a decent tight end? They've got a somewhat promising rookie in Christopher Herndon. Um, but so so the Jets in, the Jets put out a bunch of tight ends. They're like third in the league in, sec, in two tight end and three tight end sets. Um, but I mean the Vikings have already played against uh, number one in the league, the Eagles, um, in, in that respect. And they and they put out uh, a Loka and Curse to cover that two tight end set because the Eagles pass most often out of that two tight end set. Um, but the Jets they like to run the ball when they have two tight ends or three tight ends on the field like most teams. Um, so I would still probably, because the injury to my cues, I would still probably put, you know, Georgia Loka or Jaron Curse out there because I think they could probably win against the run blocking of uh, Jordan Leggett and, and uh, Tomlinson. Uh, they're, I mean, I, I think aside from Herndon, there's not a ton of talent there, but they like to use it nevertheless. Um, none of them are really, I think, liabilities as receivers but they're just not great run blockers. And when they put them on the field, they like to run a lot. So um, yeah, there's talent, I think, in that rookie um, who, uh, who I think he's already showing that he can outplay his draft slot. But uh, I don't know that it's going to be like a George Kittle or a Zach Ertz or a Dallas Goddard kind of thing. That would be a, uh, that would be a major step off in his ability at that point to like, yeah. be listed in that sort of group. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I guess the, the biggest question I have is about the run game for the Jets. You know, the, they live and die by that run, so is this something the Vikings will be able to, to bottle up? Yeah, I mean, the Vikings have been pretty good against the run this year, um, especially after that first game uh, against San Francisco. Uh, obviously, uh, they, they have to stay a lot more disciplined than they were in the first couple of weeks of the season. Uh, Eric Hendricks has to like finish tackles in a way that he's been kind of struggling with this season. Um, but for the most part, I would imagine that the Vikings do pretty well because the Jets run blocking, I think, is more of a surprise than it is something that they kind of relied on being as good as it is right they, now. They just sort of accidentally lucked into having a line that could block. Right, for and, run. It's, a, right, not and it's not like Seattle for where run. everyone is like shocked. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They lucked into not overpaying a quarterback. <laughs> I mean, they did, right? Like, I mean, yeah. they got to invest elsewhere. <laughs> but, uh... Sam Darnold is the future. Yeah, for, for now. Of what? Of the Jets? Now, now, Sam Darnold is going to make a wonderful college football analyst one day on ESPN. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. Yeah, yeah. He's Matt Leiter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did I tell you I caught Brady Quinn's uh, football radio show once? Brady Quinn's pretty good at it. He's yeah, pretty yeah. good at it. It was surprising. He's got Matt Leiner at a bar. Yeah, yeah that sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> drinking away the drinking away the pain. Yeah. <laughs> so, is the 
but so they just kind of lucked into the so they just kind of lucked into the situation then. Yeah, yeah. As, yeah. And, and it's not to say that those linemen aren't talented. I think it's just more that it's kind of surprising. Uh, but I, I would trust the Vikings' defensive line. The only issue is that Daniil Hunter entered the injury report today uh, with a groin injury. Chris Thomas of the Pioneer Press reported that Zimmer said it was part of the plan, but I'm still concerned, right? Because part of the plan for him to get hurt, or part of the plan for him to be right. Yeah, if it's a, if it's a vet day, that that's not a big issue. But I mean, he's listed with a specific injury, a groin injury. So that's a worry. Deshaun Bauer is healthy. He's fully participating, so he'll be available for the game. Right. It's not quite the same thing, right, to have uh, his former LSU teammate instead of him. But. Um, you know, that I, I would generally trust the line. Sheldon Richardson's been really good against the run. Uh, Lindvall Joseph, obviously, is really good against the run. Uh, and Stephen Weatherly is showing that he can play really well against the run. So uh, I think that, generally speaking, I would trust the Vikings to, if not at least shut down the run game, at least prevent it from becoming too impactful. Well, and since we have Mike Hughes out, it's worth talking about the corner situation against, right. the, against these receivers and Darnold. Uh, what can we expect the corners to be able to uh, pull off against a rookie quarterback who's been, I think the best way to describe it has been inconsistent. Inconsistent is a good way to put it. His last two games have been, you know, a lot better than the first four, but I, I would imagine people like Xavier Rhodes and, and, and uh, you know, Trey Waynes, uh, assuming they're healthy for the full game, uh, have the ability to pounce on a lot of those routes. I was trying to, so, so the corners, uh, I was, I was what I was trying to remember was the last time Xavier Rhodes limped off the field during a game. Because I don't remember it happening this year, and it happened 16 times last year at least, <laughs> including the playoffs. Right, yeah. So I was just, I was just curious uh, kind of what, what we should be looking at as far as like coverage assignments or like how, how that kind of breaks down. Yeah, I think, um, I, think it w I wouldn't be surprised if Xavier Rhodes uh, ended up uh, shadowing uh, Jermaine Curse. Um, but I mean, if he shattered Robbie Anderson, that would make sense to me too. Like I think uh, preventing big plays is kind of the where the Vikings should kind of focus. Uh, and having Mackenzie Alexander or Trey Waynes uh, take on sort of whoever's kind of left is fine. Um, in terms of their ability to kind of pounce on Darnold, I think uh, generally speaking, the Vikings corners have, have shown a lot of growth in their ability to recognize route combinations as they develop. Uh, and pounce on those routes. Uh, they've been, I think, better at getting into into positions to generate turnovers than they have been over the last couple of years, despite the fact that they've been such a good defense. So uh, I think they're kind of at the point where they can take advantage of the fact that Darnold is willing to take a ton of chances. Well, let's talk about uh, the offensive side of the ball for the Vikings. Uh, Kirk Cousins has been doing very well uh, lately, although I think if I have one major complaint about Kirk Cousins, uh, that isn't covered as much in the media as I feel it should be. It feels like his overthrows aren't like his, his throws to the sideline mm -hmm. when it's a wasted play, just throw it out. Yeah, they always seem like they're five or ten yards short. Well, I mean, and they're always one, in one danger of, of being. Uh, yeah, one of the interceptions yeah. was that. Yeah. Like he just throws a lame duck out there, which is fine. You can throw that. But a little more power, and we know he has power because right. he overthrows receivers that are streaking <laughs> down or the sidelines or it gets right. blocked. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It is. It is a, a weird and specific complaint, but it is one that has <laughs> showed up a lot. No, no, no I agree. Uh, and there have been a couple of throwaways that have landed short. That I mean, they're bizarre, right? Because you don't have to like show touch on a throwaway, so you can just rifle it. Um, so you, I'm can, not... you can unleash your inner grossman. Yeah, right, yeah, you can unleash <laughs> You can dragon. unleash that dragon. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't really know kind of what's happening there, and there's still problems where you're getting miscommunication, uh, you know, deep downfield, trying to figure out kind of where receivers are supposed to be. Uh, and I don't know how to fix that. Um, the Jets are showing, I think, a lot of kind of talent. Uh, you know, they got Morris Claiborne, they've got uh, Marcus May started the last three games uh, at free safety, and uh, Jamal Adams is really good at defending the run, and he's been okay in coverage. He's been kind of exploited for some big plays. Um, but the, the secondary does have the capability, I think, to take advantage of any mistakes. Uh, the I think they've generated 10 interceptions on defense, and four of them have been uh, off of, like, just dumb errors from the offense, or five if you count miscommunications. Um, one of them, I mean, they had five interceptions against Stafford. One of them was a miscommunication. And in the last couple of games, they've generated a bunch of interceptions just bouncing off of receivers' hands and stuff. Uh, and so about half of their interceptions come from them pouncing 
on a mistake that a receiver or a quarterback made that aren't like generative of the defense. Like the right. defense didn't create the interception in the same way. So uh, if he continues to make those kinds of mistakes, and you know they've been they've been creating a lot of fumbles, uh, if he continues to make those kind of mistakes, you know I fully expect the Jets to be able to to take advantage of them because they just have so far. Well, I guess the other thing that I want to mention uh, briefly, as far as uh, as far as the Jets game is concerned, is uh, I mean, if we're looking at the Vikings offense and how emerging, <laughs> I mention every show that that the Thielen's having a coming out party. Right. Yeah. At, at this point, that's all he's doing. Yeah, the little known uh, the little receiver known from Detroit Lakes. Uh, Adam the, Thielen. The meme, of course, being that. Did you Wait, hear you? Pride of Detroit Lakes. Uh, they will erect a sign and a statue for him. <laughs> I drive through there at least once a year. There will be a gigantic one next to the Wee Fest like <laughs> right. area. Exactly. Right, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's going to have so many elementary schools in that <laughs> county. Adam Thielen High. Like, it's going to be great. But uh, So, Thielen and Diggs. Uh, and sometimes Treadwell. Uh, what are they looking at as far as... Uh, uh, so, the, the duo of, of Diggs and Thielen, uh, and sometimes Treadwell when he shows up and catches like he did last game. Right. Credit where credit's due. Uh, what are they looking at as far as coverage from the, uh, from the Jets' secondary in quotations? So the Jets run a t right. So the Jets run a ton of cover three. They like to put Jamal Adams kind of underneath, um, and uh, and for the most part, you'll see a bunch of cover three beating concepts do pretty well against them. If you take a look at some of the biggest plays that the Jets have given up, they've been in the seams of the cover three zones. Uh, they've been uh, a bunch of sideline throws. So like those corners have been performing pretty well, but they don't have a ton of deep speed or size to compete with some of the faster receivers. I mean like. Blake Bortles got a big play against them, throwing to the sideline with Dante Moncrief. I mean, like, neither of those guys are, you know, reliable stars or anything like that. I think that's an understatement, yes. Right. Um, <laughs> and so sometimes those receivers will just, or those cornerbacks will just get beat on the sidelines in the cover three. Um, but, you know, when they do expect something like, uh, you know, four verticals, which is very popular against cover three, they will switch to a quarters coverage, and they're pretty good in that. Um, Andrew Luck and Baker Mayfield, I think, uh, just decided to challenge the quarters coverage just by putting up uh, contested catches and, and, and a couple of times uh, those receivers just came down with the ball in those contested catch situations. We know that Thielen and Diggs are, are both two of the best contested catch receivers in the NFL. So even in situations where I would expect uh, the coverage to have won, for the, for the wrong play to be called and those receivers not to be open, I would expect Cousins to try and test out whether or not those cornerbacks and safeties have the ability to win a contested catch against Thielen or Diggs. As it is, I think that um, you've got like a size advantage against uh, Buster, was it Screen? Screen? Screen. 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 Yeah. Um, this is why it's helpful to have an audience. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think they, I think they do have that size advantage. I think um, was it uh, Tremaine Johnson uh, has been having like a, a pretty good showing so far. But I think, uh, generally speaking, I mean they they do a ton of zone uh, except when they blitz, and it's pretty obvious when they blitz. Um, they like to put up a bunch of people at the line of scrimmage, and then they'll go into cover one. So they have a single high safety. Um, if you just have a bunch of zone beaters and then check into your 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 man coverage beaters uh, in those situations you'll probably be fine. Like, I don't think the, the defensive play calling is innovative. It's fine, but it's not gonna be something that like confuses someone like Kirk Cousins. So, uh, for the most part, I, wouldn't, I probably wouldn't do a ton of special stuff. Um, run four verts, see if they see it. Uh, and if they don't, you can throw it to, if Dalvin Cook is healthy, throw it to Dalvin Cook underneath. Or Latavius Murray, who's been pretty good this year. Yeah. Um, so, 155. Yeah, all right. Davious. All Davious. <laughs> all Davious. <laughs> I, That's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're, we've been trying to get that in. Not there. Hash, all Davious. Hashtag. <laughs> no, no, no. Hashtag All Davious all day. <laughs> Thank you. We have an episode title. I'm so proud. So all Davious. But uh, speaking of uh, speaking of hashtag All Davious. Uh, he is, uh, he'll likely be in the backfield. 
Uh, Cook did practice yesterday, but, but did, did not, not practice, practice today. today. I don't know what's up with that. I'm, yeah. I'm still blaming Dusty on this. Yeah, it's probably, yeah, yeah, I it's refuse probably Dusty's fault. to believe I'm wrong <laughs> about this specific One more reason you should slap him. <laughs> we're we're, we're, we're going to make this happen. I'm, I'm going to film this. But, so Latavius Murray likely in the backfield. Yeah. Uh, what are we looking at as far as... It, it's kind of hard to say, I suppose, because he did have this breakout game last week against an admittedly god awful run defense for the Arizona Cardinals. I mean, probably the worst run defense in the NFL. Yeah. If you're going to get back on track, you might as well do it against the worst. <laughs> right, yeah. So, uh, what like should <laughs> what should hashtag all Davius be looking at for, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you for, for work on here? Well, so uh, one of the issues is that Darren Lee is going to be the primary coverage linebacker, and he's been having like a rebirth of the season. He was a huge disappointment when they drafted him, and then uh, I think well, this is his third year, I think. Um, his second year wasn't as good. But this year he's been fantastic. Uh, and it's not just kind of the big plays that he's been showing up on. Uh, you know, because he got a couple of interceptions this year. I think he has two. Um, but he also just has been generally very, very good in coverage. Um, so that's going to be a big problem. Because I don't think Latavius Murray is as good of a route runner as Darren Lee is showing that he's as good of a coverage linebacker. Now, if you can get him on, like, Avery Williamson or something, you're probably going to get open. Um, but for the most part, that's the matchup I'd be concerned about. Uh, Latavius Murray is one of the best pass-protecting backs in the NFL. Uh, the Vikings' offensive line isn't good. Uh, you might get the most out of Latavius Murray by keeping him in pass protection, except on, like, third and eight or something like that. Um, so we might not see as much, uh, like, statistical production from him. But we might see him still be really important to the way that the passing game operates. And of course, if we're looking at short passing and usage of running back, we are still using Diggs in a uh, Percy Harvin-ish yeah, it's kind of weird. Type of role. I don't that, love it, but the offense is doing well, so I don't have like a ton of room to complain. Uh, but yeah, I was about to call it the Cordero Patterson like situation, but he was never really used effectively right, yeah, in that sort of yeah, situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They so. tried. God bless them, they tried. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we have Dan Bale. We should stop. We are just not gonna. You know, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> if Arif is known for anything, it's his hard hit, hit, his hard hitting <laughs> kicking analysis. <laughs> so that's kind of uh, that's about it for the the Jets game preview. I mean, we are looking at a Vikings team that is beginning to build some steam, uh, especially after the trouncing of a terrible team. Always a good way to get your season Again, back on track. Always a, good, yeah. always a good way to get it back in here. Usually it's against the Vikings. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. It's about time that we do it to someone exactly. else. Exactly. Right. It's a nice um, change of pace. Is there anything else that we should know going into uh, the Jets game uh, as Vikings fans? Anything else that would just kind of like maybe surprise us out of an ability that the Jets have that maybe isn't... I keep using the word ability for some reason, like it's a superhero thing. <laughs> I watched a terrible in-flight movie and it just, just stuck with It's me. just stuck with you, yeah. Uh, um, but is there something that the Jets do that is not necessarily as well known uh, by the general public? If it's not that well known, I don't know it. Um, <laughs> they have great cheer. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they, we can spell! <laughs> <laughs> that's more than some Packers can do. <laughs> that, is, that is more than some Packers can do. Um, but if, if you take a look at like the the Jets Spell through a bunch of like if you take a look at like uh, the different like advanced <laughs> metrics that the, the the Jets have put together, the only thing that really sticks out are uh, like their high interception rate, which we talked about. Not a lot of it is because of the defense necessarily creating those turnovers. Um, but, yeah, I mean, they like to run the ball a lot, which is not, like, unique among NFL teams. Uh, Crowell and, and Powell have been performing way better than a lot of people expected them to. But, again, that's not, I don't think, particularly concerning. It's not like you've got David Johnson or Saquon Barkley or whoever. They're just, like, pretty good. So, yeah, I mean, it, this is like a team. I mean, they're 3-3. Three three. They're average in a lot of respects. I think they've got a lot of volatility, so there's a bunch of big play potential to watch out for, but it also means that they could blow themselves out by like 28 points. 
there's a lot of possibilities uh, as to what's going on. I, yeah, right. Personally, I just like a blowout and just, you yeah. know, something not to worry about after the first quarter. It, it would be, be nice. Different. One time. Uh, that's that's all I'm really hoping for here, is to um, to leave happy without like battery marks on the back of my head. That's <laughs> all I'm really looking for. Well, that is going to conclude our uh, Jets game preview. Uh, we are going to move on to the mailbag, and what I was thinking we might do is take a mailbag question from the uh, from the Twitter feed, and then if somebody has a uh, question here, uh, we can we can move there. So I'm going to go. I, I do have an important question here, however. Uh, from a Twitter user by the name of Purr who says, which Jet player would you most like to add to the Vikings roster? Man, that one's pretty tough. Um... Is Cromarty still with them? <laughs> 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 Cromarty's got kids, man. That's... Leonard Williams. Yeah, I was thinking about Leonard Williams um, because he's been doing really well. There's that gif of him going around on Twitter blowing up Quentin Nelson. Um, but I, th I think actually, um, so I know some Jets fans were like kind of disappointed in his production last year. I thought he played great last year. Um, he just didn't like generate, I think, a total number of sacks that was whatever. He's great. Um, the only thing is, like, if I'm picking whoever I can get, I'm trying to think of where the Vikings are weak that the Jets are strong. And it's like, yeah, I could get Jamal Adams instead of Andrew Sandejo, but that's not like a huge priority or anything like that. Uh, yeah, I could get Darren Lee instead of like Anthony Barr, I guess. But I mean, I'm an Anthony Barr defender, so I'm not going to say that. Um, yeah, I mean, Leonard Williams would be pretty great to have, especially because of the like the thin nature of the defensive line right now. Um, but yeah, I don't have like a, this guy with a bullet kind of thought, and it's and it's not because the Jets don't have talent. It's because where they have talent is also kind of where uh, the Vikings happen to be talented too. All right, uh, we had a question here. Why don't you lean into the mic here and? Uh, <laughs> Is it leaning in like you're... Oh. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Arif. My name's Nick. Hey, Nick. We met earlier. It's, it's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this isn't like it's, it's for show. It's <laughs> my, I, very Hollywood. I know that. Um, I'm curious, Arif, about what your process looks like when it comes to writing like your film articles. That's something that I've, I've followed for several years. I'm really, I, I really appreciate that just knows the way you break it down with the All-22. Um, what does it look like when you go in to, uh, to look for specific plays or specific players or anything that you want to look for? Is it that you're going in with an idea, I want to watch what Brian O'Neill did this week, or are you going in with an open mind, just like, let's see what the All-22 tells me? Well, I think it's a combination of a lot of things. So uh, the first thing I do is I usually just ask whoever's covering the team whose opinion that I, that I respect, which some teams, maybe they don't have those guys. Um, I'm not going to name names. I don't want to call out any specific beats. But, uh, yeah, and sometimes I'll just, like, ask people, like, hey, what are you seeing that, like, strikes you as interesting or what's kind of unique about the team that kind of marks what, what their identity is, right? Um, and so that's kind of how I, I, I picked up on, for example, how often the Eagles use two tight end sets, how often they pass out of those two tight end sets kind of compared to the rest of the league. Um, so that's a big part of it. Some of it's also... Um, I've got like the spreadsheet that I've got updating that gives me uh, a bunch of like specific data about like for example how often you use play action, how often they use particular personnel, uh, how often they pass deep and that'll give you some idea of like the identity of the team if, it, if they've got kind of a unique thing. So I'll go into that and then I can go to the All-22 or sometimes what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll go to the Pro Football Reference Play Finder and, uh, and sort plays by like expected points added, right? What are the biggest plays that they've made? What are the biggest plays that have been made against them? Take a look at those plays, see if there's any commonality, uh, and, uh, and kind of just kind of move from there. But sometimes it's just kind of important to just make sure you sit down and watch a couple of games to get a feel for, because like the nature of those big plays is that they're flukes. They have to be outliers kind of by example. So you do have to make sure that, that you just watch some of the games. Um, the process ends up being kind of different every week just because uh, the people I know that know the teams are different, the way I, I get information evolves over time. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answered the question. Yeah. Uh, next question is uh, from Brett who asks, do we have any defensive ends left? <laughs> well, Deshaun Bauer is back. I know that's not incredibly exciting, but that's true. Uh, Daniil Hunter is on the injury report, so we'll see kind of how that goes. 
Um, but there's at least two with Stephen Weatherly and Tashawn Bauer. And a third one, if you count the defensive tackle, Jalen Holmes, <laughs> who played defensive end at Ohio State. Um, <laughs> that's, 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 that's fair. That's just mean at this point. <laughs> oh! oh look at this is this is the sort of thing that I've grown to. I've, I've grown accustomed to this in New York Cousins. now. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Hey. Salut. Uh, Luke, Luke asks, can something be so overrated that it flips and becomes underrated? Well, yeah, of course. Like, well, I feel like it happens more often the other direction, where something becomes so underrated that it becomes overrated. Case Keenum is a pretty good example. Um, it's 35 to 10. Right. <laughs> Wait, was the was the most recent <laughs> touchdown also defensive? Know, yeah. Probably. Um, <laughs> Rally caps. <laughs> right. uh, I'm trying to think of something that's become so overrated that it's become underrated. Uh, probably shows that got really hyped way too fast. Run pass option. Run pass option. Run pass option. I was that's gonna go. With, I was gonna go with Sriracha. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. That's a good one. Everybody that's got really burned out on it. Yeah. And then like you find it in the back of your fridge, it's still there. Yeah, yeah right. It's and good. It's still good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, New York. <laughs> <laughs> really? What, what? That's a kind of became overrated and now it's Have one of the free beers from one of the potential listeners. <laughs> and then we'll talk. Uh, question from anyone here. Uh, let me just hand, that, hand this over to you. Yeah, he's just blue balling you, huh? Hey guys, uh, <laughs> Chris speaking here. Good to meet you. Uh, this is a two-part question. The first sure. is, what game, what week, does Stefan Diggs outgain Adam Thielen? That's a good and one. And the second question is, what is your personal touchdown celebration as critics of the dead arm dance? <laughs> I'm going to answer the second one first. Uh, critics need not be able to create. <laughs> That is in, not answer. In <laughs> case you haven't been following Arif on Twitter this week, that has been his answer to everything. Yeah. I, I got into a fight with somebody who was like, could you do a better job than Jason Witten? I have no idea. The odds say yes. Um, but I told him, like, you, I don't have to do a better job to know that he sucks. Did you say that to Kyle Rudolph, too? <laughs> At Kyle Rudolph. Yeah, when I saw... Yak is deceiving, guys. If Yak is deceiving, his yards before catch are much lower. Deceiving Yak is the name of a movie I saw on, like, being advertised down the street there. Like, I don't... Let's see, uh, actually, I think the, the next week against the Saints is a really good... Um, <laughs> oh, we're with you, but <laughs> it's a it's a really good uh, game for you know wide receiver two to break out. Uh, where I think um, you know Marshawn Lattimore is not having as good a year as he was last year, but he's still a very good cornerback. Uh, One play he missed, and what? <laughs> Uh, occasionally uh, they will. Uh, they don't always shadow corners, but it's kind of like um, it's kind of like Patrick Peterson. Sometimes he shadows, sometimes he doesn't. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, but uh, if they decide to, you know, put cornerback one on Adam Thielen, which teams haven't been shadowing this year uh, against the Vikings, um, a little bit with Patrick Peterson, who apparently covered Diggs for 58, 59% of the game or whatever. Um, but I think, you know, if Thielen's continuing this streak, they're just gonna change, are you, yeah. Uh, they're, they're probably gonna change their defensive approach and, uh, and that's gonna open up a lot for Diggs. And so I think uh, the Saints game is a really good example of a game where there's a huge mismatch in cornerback quality which will result in like a lot of opportunities for one of the two receivers. Does, uh, does Marcus Williams have tackles? Uh, I, I've heard that he's focused on that. Yeah. Um, that, was a, that was an issue he had coming out of college, too. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's a really good safety. It's just, you know, the one play. Marcus, I, you might be thinking of the NDSU Marcus Williams. This one, I think, was drafted in the second round. Yeah. So while we're talking about Yak for just a moment, uh, Raul asks, after Albert Wilson torched the Bears last weekend, he proclaimed himself the Yak King, to which Golden Tate scoffed. 
as one, that makes sense. As one does. Yeah. It struck me that proclaiming a true Yak King may be difficult by a statistical measure. What is the most accurate measure, and by this measure, who is the true Yak King? I don't know that there's an accurate measure. Um, there, I mean, so there's a couple of ways to do it, right? So you could do the most uh, yards after catch per reception, and uh, Golden Tate ranks like second or third in that. Like he ranks pretty high in that. You can do total yards after the catch between 2015 and 2017. Golden Tate leads the league in yard in total yards after the catch. But as we talked about, was it last week's show? Maybe a week and a half ago, we were talking about Kyle Rudolph's yak. Uh, where you have to adjust the amount of yards after catch you get based on the depth of target, right? And so you're, you expect to get more yak after you get like a short pass than a long one. Um, so if you adjust for that, between 2015 and 2017, Julio Jones leads the league by a lot in terms of total yak generated after you adjust for where they catch the ball. If you look at, if you look just at 2018, it's Albert Wilson. So, I mean, he's he's got, yeah, right, yeah. It's weird. Yeah, yeah. Which, I mean, yeah. And it's like a small sample, right? Yeah. Um, if you take a look at it in, in terms of, like, percentage of yards that come after the catch, the first 20 are running backs, which, you know, yeah. that makes sense. Uh, but then the top receiver is Cordero Patterson in terms of yak percentage, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then after that, it's Albert Wilson. So, so yeah, and then after that, it's Albert Wilson. So, like, I guess this year, Albert Wilson has an argument, but, like, for the most part, it's, like, Julio and Golden Tate that have, like, maybe the best arguments to be the Yak King. It's just an odd thing to declare yourself to be king of. <laughs> yeah, I, f I feel like it's, like, awarding yourself something between, like, the championship trophy and a participation trophy. <laughs> like, it's like, yeah, I got third place. I'm putting it right on my trophy case. Uh, also asks, how will Mike Hughes' injury affect Trey Wayne's contract pass? Uh, probably not. I don't think Mike Hughes' injury is uh, that long-term based off, you know, uh, the way that those injuries have been recovering. I mean, like, yeah, obviously... Uh, it sucks, right? The MRI confirmed it was like an ACL. Um, but, I mean, people have been coming back from them, like, unless you're Robert Griffin, like, people have been coming back from them uh, and returning to mostly full form. Jamal Charles did it, Adrian Peterson did it, Dalvin Cook kind of. Almost did it. Dalvin, Dalvin Cook kind of. Kind of. Kinda. Is, is important there. Do we have any other questions from the audience here? Let me just. Uh, I got I got it. All right, so this is Jesse, hey. New York Vikings fan, Skull Vikes. Um, so I guess my question is uh, kind of regarding one of the former questions is, all right, so the 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 leading like hundred yard reception games is is Calvin Johnson with eight. Yeah. Do you think Thielen can break that? Yeah. 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 Um, which is I don't even think Thielen is like a better receiver than Calvin Johnson was at his peak, which is like not a controversial statement. Um, but I mean, it's just kind of the way that uh, passing offenses are, the way that passing defenses are, the way that the Vikings are funneling a ton of targets to Thielen. I mean, he had one game with 19 targets. Like, um, I mean, he, like his streak is going to get broken at some point. I mean, if it doesn't, amazing, right? But his streak is going to get broken at some point. But that doesn't mean after the streak is over, he's not going to get, you know, one or two more 100-yard games. So, yeah, I think he'll break the, uh, Calvin Johnson's record. I think there's a good chance he could break, uh, was it Charlie Hennigan's record for, for yeah. most to start a season? Yeah. Um, there's a good chance, kind of given who the matchups are, um, which would mean he's in a really great place to break Calvin Johnson's record. Yeah. I still think Diggs is a better receiver. <laughs> in case you were curious, that is the uh, the hill Arif is willing to die on. <laughs> that and Anthony Barr. That and Anthony. And Chad Greenway, not being a... Yeah, and Chad Greenway. <laughs> that, that, that's, more of a, well, that's more of an old school reach, but yeah. still. Really, really North Code in its roots. Yeah. That's like if you were a fan of 2018 Arif, you'll love 2015 Arif. Exactly. That's a terrible football player. <laughs> if, if you need to binge watch... So is he... <laughs> Oh. oh what? That's what he tweeted at me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Brian Jellerson asks, 
uh, with all of these updates about limited participants in practice, I begin to wonder, can Kevin McDermott ever be considered a full participant again? Well, I mean, technically, no. <laughs> But I mean, he's a, yeah, but he's gonna get like the brace off of his uh, hand slash pinky soon, I hear. Which um, I guess would mean that he's participating in every rep. That there's not a ton of practice that long snappers get. So in like the eight reps that he has, he'll probably do all eight of them at some point. <laughs> uh, also from Brian Jellison, he asks. Is Cook potential trade fodder? Do you think he's shown enough uh, when healthy that someone would be willing to give up some early draft round or early round draft picks? At this point, I'd almost be more upset to see pay go based on reliability alone. That's a hot take, I think. I, I would I would keep Cook uh, it's kinda weird that we're answering this. Yeah, I mean Cook has a better contract. Um, he's younger. Uh, he's got, got more explosive potential. If he can't return for a game this year, well, then he doesn't have he doesn't have trade value, right? So then he's not trade fodder. So like any any reason that he would generate trade value is also a reason that a team would want him, which is a reason that the Vikings should keep him. Uh, and I think just generally speaking, given that they've designed the running game about the, uh, around the things that he can do well, they should keep him. Sorry, we were just looking at the score. It is now 42 to 10. <laughs> wow! I took the under in this game, and the under was 40. <laughs> that, um, that's tragic. Uh, Agro Magnet asked the question, how worried should Arif be going into this week, into this week's second place game uh, with the North Coast Fantasy Football League using an unproven waiver wire kicker? Who do I have? I don't, I don't know. I just picked... Who cares about kickers and I mean the in North Coast? League, yeah, kickers yeah, actually actually kickers matter. Kickers. Yeah, I I don't know who I got. <laughs> I got a waiver wire kicker? That can't be right. That's I'm looking this up right now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on to a question from the audience uh, here in uh, just a moment. While Arif tries to figure out <laughs> what just is exactly. Oh, who I got is. Brett Maher. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, my 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 kicker's on a bye. I have to get another kicker. <laughs> It's the rule. If you don't start a kicker in this yeah, league... Yeah, you, you lose if you don't have a kicker. Absolutely, 100%. All right. Yeah, I'm not confident. Hi, guys. That's this a good Nick question. Again. Uh, long time, second time. <laughs> um, so this question is actually... I, I think of my dad when I ask this question because my dad always likes a very particular type of player on the Vikings, and he's the reason that I'm a Vikings fan. Um, so I'm curious, uh, which tight end for the Vikings was best? Jim Kleinsaucer, Jermaine Wiggins, or Byron Chamberlain? Wow! Jeez, Jesus, going back, digging deep. <laughs> wow! I love Kleinsaucer. I'm I'm gonna have to go with Kleinsaucer. Yeah. Yeah. Like for real, yeah, it, right, yeah, like yeah. It shouldn't count. Like no, no, I mean, I, the tight end, and, 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 <laughs> and for some of those years, he wore a fullback number. But he met with the tight ends in the tight end meeting room. He's just like, he caught every pass in his shoelaces and then gained six more yards. <laughs> yeah, it was great. It was great. Uh, but he's the best blocking tight end. Uh, that, uh, yeah, of all time. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I sure. I was going to say that the Vikings had, but I'm not going to argue. Uh, um, if, they put, if they put those sort of blockers in the Hall of Fame, then... I mean, he, he has a shot, right, in, in, in that world. I mean, what? Uh, it's surprising yeah, athleticism, right? <laughs> Go ahead. Jermaine Wiggins was truly the deceptive athlete. <laughs> One could almost say he was a work in progress. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's all James is here for, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess, uh, I guess, if I can't pick Klein Saucer, I would pick Jermaine Wiggins. So Kyle. Oh, yeah. So Kyle Slaby clearly listened to the last episode because the question is, so Shadow Coverage Matrix is the new X-Men villain. Right. Who would round out the new Brotherhood of Mutants? Arif is Magneto, obviously. No one, no one grandstands quite like him. Uh, James seems like the juggernaut type. Okay, I'll, okay, I'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll buy it. Uh, Don from Ohio is probably Toad. No other character fits <laughs> yeah, okay. so well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was actually thinking Morph because he went pretty easily between the hoodie and, and Ohio. I was thinking Nightcrawler. I don't know. 
We're giving, eh, maybe. We wouldn't give him. I like Morph because Morph, from the animated show especially, Well, Morph was Morph. invented just for the animated yeah, yeah, yeah. show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, But Morph especially would just, like, find a way to, <laughs> like... Hey, hey! Uh, we, we, we What's have, going on, we have, we have an additional right, guest cut, here. Cut, cut, cut. <laughs> edit, edit. So, but but Morph especially would be uh, would just kind of be overly moody and everything, and I kind of get that from uh, from Dom, especially because his next question is: since James is pretty clear, it's pretty clear James made a deal with Satan, so he could win the North Code Fantasy Football League. In doing so, part of the deal was the Vikings would have significant injuries issues throughout the year. Since all members of the North Code team are part of each other's team, is Arif okay with James' deal with the devil? After this wow. week, after this last week, how is Arif okay with this? <laughs> I mean, when when we win, we win. So that's good. Um, I I I won't uh, I won't comment on James's religious beliefs. How about that? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, dear Mister, my brand was so bad that I had to file it for bankruptcy. Well, all because and, I defended some foods. <laughs> and Mister, I had to date a mortician to sacrifice bodies for my deal with Satan. <laughs> I'm in the process of moving and was wondering if you had any tips uh, so to not overstress myself. Hire a moving company. <laughs> I was gonna say just don't. It's <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. It's I mean it's just stressful. I like it. It's not unnecessary. Yeah, unnecessary. The whole thing of like living together especially is a terrible idea. <laughs> I know this. I can say this. My girlfriend will not be listening to this. Right. Uh, oh, but probably. if you do hire a moving company, like read the reviews. <laughs> <laughs> Good lord, yeah. yeah. What Turns about out you trade for Dalvin Cook? I'm not gonna trade Dalvin. And we actually did just answer this. <laughs> well, but who who are they trading with? Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to know when it started. <laughs> I haven't made any decision. <laughs> what about? So, uh, do we have any more questions? For uh, you've been you've yeah. been conspicuously I'm quiet. Hi, uh, it's Brian. Uh, question is, it's just a pretty general question because it's something that worried us earlier this year in the draft when nothing was really done about it. The offensive line. Right. Can, can you uh, spell your name for the, us, please, Brian? It's B-R-I-A-N Got exclamation it. It. point. <laughs> and, uh, no, just because uh, at times it seems like they finally get it together and they actually do a good job holding off, you know, for a pass rush and occasionally opening up, like, uh, for all Davies. Right. Said, but at other exactly. times, they make atrocious mistakes. I mean, especially yeah. the tackles, literally barely getting a hand on the... Defender and the defender just rolls in and crushes Cousins. Yeah. So, do you think they're gonna somehow meld together at least into a more solid unit by the end of the year? In the middle. Uh, I'm not confident that they will. Um, I think that. Wrong. It, <laughs> I, I do think that they are seriously considering playing Brian O'Neill, um, yeah. based off of the comments from today, uh, which would be great. Um, if Riley Reef returns to health. Which, who knows? Uh, and Brian O'Neill plays at right tackle. I think they've got a lot of options, but I think I think you're always going to be worried about Mike Remmers at guard. Like I think that just the way that he plays offensive line, it's fine at tackle, and it just it doesn't really work at guard because he takes so long to get his hands in position. Um, so that's always going to be an issue. Um, having Pat Elfline there is great. Uh, and it's improved already, the communication along the line. When he's healthy. Right, when he's healthy, right. Uh, and then Tom Compton is very up or down. He had a great game uh, against the Cardinals, um, but he's straight also... Straight out of Compton. Right, straight, yeah, out, straight out of Compton. <laughs> uh, which is kind of, I think, what the defensive line often says. Um, but that's the inconsistency. Right, but yeah, he's very inconsistent. So you'll end up with games where, where where he just gives up like a ton of sacks. Like he did really poorly against Aaron Donald, which everyone does. In fairness, he did pretty poorly against DeForest Buckner, which again everyone does. But when you're in the playoffs, those are the kind of defensive tackles that he'll be up against. And both Remmers and uh, and Compton have been really poor against those. And I don't know that they're going to have options to replace them. I don't know that either of them are in a position where they'll improve over time. They're both longtime veterans in the league, and they're already not at the point where they need to be in terms of being consistent starting guards. So uh, I think at tackle, you'll probably see some improvement just with the consideration of Brian O'Neill. 
but I think at guard you're always going to have that worry. Uh, last question. Which player, if injured for the rest of the season, would be the most devastating besides Cousins? Besides Cousins. Well, what's the guy that lost his mind? Fields. Yeah. Uh, Xavier Rhodes. Fields. That would be pretty bad. Lindball. No. Uh, that would be pretty bad. That, that's interesting. Uh, head health line again. Uh, um, do you think if Kirk Cousins got injured, you could retrade for Case Keenum? No, they would probably try to retrade for Teddy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Get him from the Saints, That's yeah. Fun. Bring him back. <laughs> Teddy. Teddy! How many illegitimate kids Teddy. do you have? <laughs> um, I, wait, if it's Thielen, it's not as big because they have digs. Uh, obviously, it would suck. Maybe you go back to the defensive tackles, the Williamsburg brothers that you had. Like the years Williamsburg, ago. yeah, the Williamsburg brothers, you know the maybe Dante oh, the hipsters out of Brooklyn, yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, I given the injury state of the defensive ends, might be Daniel Hunter. Like they did have a lot of depth there, now they don't. So I'm where, gonna go with Daniel Hunter. Where is Jared Allen when you need him? Uh, retired in Arizona. Well, that is going to be it for uh, for this episode of Norse Code, the live Norse Code experience in living color. Uh, again, big thanks to Bar None for, uh, for putting this on. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. This has been really awesome. Great. This has been fantastic. Easily one of the highlights of the year. Uh, Arif, before we go, there we go. We even got the we even have the score uh, the score song. So that, <laughs> so that is going to be it for the episode. Again, thanks so much for Barnum for uh, for hosting us here. This has been awesome. Uh, before we go, Arif, uh, what do you have to plug for us? Um, yeah, hopefully I'll have a Jets preview up. <laughs> it's not done yet, uh, so we'll see if I'll, I'll be able to stay up late enough to do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, you can find my stuff at the Athletic. I've got a film room breakdown of everything that went right, basically, in the Cardinals game. Uh, I mean, the Vikings had more talent, they had better execution, and they had better coaching. And the film breakdown covers kind of all aspects of that. All right, so that is going to be it for us. So for Arif, my name is James. Thank you guys so much for listening, and please remember to tweet that even if it is a work in progress. <laughs> and we will see you uh, hopefully after the game. Woo! Yeah. Woo Norse Code is the largest and only division of Norse Code LLC. You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's Vikings blog at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human is Arif Hassan, and he can be found on Twitter at Arif Hassan NFL. I am your producer and co-host, and my name is James Pagoshnik. You can find me at the show's official Twitter feed, at NorseCodeDN. If you'd like to donate a few bucks to the show, you can make your one-time donation at paypal.me slash NorseCode, or a recurring monthly contribution can be made by visiting patreon.com slash NorseCode. Any questions or comments that won't fit in a tweet can also be sent to norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. On behalf of the Norse Code staff, we thank you so much for listening. Our formula is this. We go out, we hit people in the mouth. <laughs>